Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In part one of this presentation, we covered important background information and then reviewed the dimorphic fungal organisms. In this section, we will pick up our discussion of pulmonary fungal infections, focusing on opportunistic yeast and molds. Opportunistic is the buzz phrase here. The questions on these organisms, namely Cryptococcus and Pneumocystis, will generally be described in a patient with HIV who has a low CD4 count. Candida is clumped in this section for reasons I'll describe later. So let's start with Cryptococcus, which has a lot of unique and important characteristics. As a result, Cryptococcus gets a lot of attention by the NBME. The ecology can be a big clue if pigeons or chickens are mentioned. Although much is made of this, these are infrequently mentioned. The transmission is pretty straightforward. The spores are inhaled and a pulmonary infection may develop in both the healthy or immunocompromised individual. In the immunocompetent host, however, the organism rarely disseminates. If immunocompromised, on the other hand, the organism does spread and here is the big ticket item with Cryptococcus. It is neurotropic, meaning it has a predilection for CNS infection and meningoencephalitis specifically. As for the microbiology, this slide is key. The organism has a capsule. NBME thinks this is the best thing since sliced bread. They are obsessed with a capsule. As with encapsulated bacteria, the capsule helps the organism escape phagocytosis. It is therefore a major virulence factor. Reproduction is through budding as this is a yeast. Those buds are described as unequal and narrow based as opposed to the broad base with blastomyces. The other key point here are the stains. For whatever reason, they love mucocarmine, and I would encourage you to do likewise. Mucocarmine stains the organism red. India ink is the other key stain. It reveals a dark background, a central organism, and a giant halo reflecting that capsule. Be prepared to see these stains and reference to the capsule in Cryptococcus questions. The pathology reinforces what we already know. The capsule forces the immune system to wall off and contain the organism. This process creates granulomas. However, what if you are T-cell deficient? You can't create that granuloma, and subsequently, you can't contain the organism. It disseminates. It will disseminate to the CNS. As you are immunocompromised, the CSF shows only a minimal inflammatory response characterized by lymphocytosis. To be clear, Immunocompetent patients may develop CNS involvement, but this is relatively uncommon compared with a compromised host. Rather, CNS involvement is most typically seen in HIV patients with a CD4 count of less than 100. Treatment again is listed only to reinforce mechanism of action of the agents. Note, flucytosine is listed and is the only pyrimidine inhibitor. As a pyrimidine inhibitor, it competes with uracil, interfering with both RNA and DNA synthesis. So to summarize, Cryptococcus is spread by pigeons, has uneven narrow budding, CNS involvement, especially if CD4 count is very low, and the two key stains to be familiar with are mucocarmine and India ink. And here's just a few more images of the same principles. Narrow based, uneven budding, India ink showing that big old capsule and mucocarmine red stain. The next opportunistic fungus is pneumocystis, still referred to as PCP by us old timers who first learned about it when it was classified as a protozoa. I mention this because even though it has been reclassified, it is still referred to as an atypical fungus in some questions. If a question talks about an atypical fungus, they are referring to pneumocystis. So what do you need to know? It is uncertain where it lives in the environment, so they won't ask. But since it causes predominantly pulmonary disease, it is believed to have airborne transmission. Bottom line, however, is that it resides in the alveoli. Pneumocystis, pneumocytes, that is a gift, less to memorize. It is described as a disc-shaped organism, and histopathology is described by staining with methinamine silver stain. Other morphologic descriptions include frisbee-shaped, or the least useful crushed ping pong balls. Infection will be described in the immunocompromised patient and more specifically the HIV infected patient not on antiretroviral therapy with a CD4 count of less than 200. The other challenging question, if you don't think about it, is where you will find it on pathologic specimens. So let's think about it. 
Infection is confirmed when seen either on induced sputum or bronchioalveolar lavage. Okay, that's not a lung biopsy. It's sputum. So where does the organism reside? It lives in the alveoli along with foamy proteinaceous material and damaged desquamated pneumocytes. In other words, we're describing pneumocystis. If they ask whether it's an intracellular or extracellular organism, what's the answer? It's an extracellular bug. As for the presentation, it will be nonspecific. Fever, cough, and dyspnea. These patients may be noted with a widened AA gradient. The chest x-ray early in the infection may be relatively normal, or it may be described with diffuse alveolar infiltrates. An elevated LDH is used as a negative prognosticator. On the path specimens, all these are demonstrating an extracellular bug that I highlight to distinguish from histoplasma. They are more or less disc shape and are pathologically described as an exudate filling the alveolar spaces. And finally, for the opportunistic yeast, we have candida. How candida finds its way into this section is uncertain, yet it is traditionally presented with opportunistic pulmonary fungal infections. However, it is a rare cause of pulmonary infection and usually from hematogenous, not oropharyngeal spread. Be prepared, therefore, to identify this organism as a commensal organism seen on bronchioalveolar lavage specimens. That is, since it could be found in the oropharynx, it readily contaminates these specimens, which is as close as this bug will get to being a pulmonary infection, as we shall see. The microbiology has some key features that make for good test questions, and so we'll cover candida in brief. So what's important? First, it is described as pleomorphic. Pleomorphic describes the ability to bud, form pseudohyphae, and true hyphae. The NBME has fun with these several different forms. It is a common commensal organism in the GI tract, vagina, and skin where it causes mucosal infections. Invasive infections generally require immunosuppression as we'll see. As for the microbiology, you should be familiar with the terms pseudohyphae and true hyphae. Pseudohyphae are simply buds that don't detach. If you can envision that in your mind's eye, it will also be easy to see the presence of constriction bounds. This description is to imply they do not have septa. True hyphae are also described. They will be represented by germ tube growth at 37 degrees. Any suggestion of germ tubes at 37 degrees is the language of Candida albicans. I previously warned you to pay attention to temperatures with fungi. 25 degrees with dimorphic organisms imply mold forms. 37 degrees with Candida implies germ tubes and true hyphae. This is esoteric, so therefore they like it. As for the immune response, PMNs are the main player against tissue invasion. It further explains the presence of microabscesses when invasions occur. That is, they evoke pus. And listed are the immunocompromising conditions, including the use of IV catheters. As mentioned, microabscesses are the histopathologic description of invasive candidal infection. And finally, unless you were given a frank pathologic specimen demonstrating tissue invasion, be on the lookout for questions describing candida as a colonizer, especially if seen in sputum or bronchioalveolar uh, lavage specimens. Here's an image of the germ tubes, which are the true hyphae of candida. And the lower image demonstrates pseudohyphae, which are buds that fail to detach, and they demonstrate those sites of constriction to distinguish them from true septae. And those are the opportunistic yeasts. So let's finish up with the opportunistic molds, which include aspergillus and mucor species. You are guaranteed to see a couple of questions on these nasty players. And we'll start with aspergillus. And although there is a spectrum of infection with aspergillus, only invasive aspergillus represents opportunistic infection. Aspergilloma reflects colonization, whereas allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis represents a hypersensitivity response. So while we're in the neighborhood, one quick slide on the aspergilloma, or fungus ball. We know that it occupies old cavities, as in previous TB. This is a non-inflammatory colonized state, which is a good gig if you're aspergillus. Free room and board. As a colonizer, it will be discovered incidentally on imaging, or the patient may present with hemoptysis. Questions on this are few and far between, but when presented, they are pretty straightforward. 
The vignette is likely to include a patient presenting with hemoptysis and a lung cavity. They either go on to ask you about the microbiologic characteristics of aspergillus or the predisposing condition that caused the cavity, namely tuberculosis. The most important fact for you to be aware of with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is that it is a hypersensitivity reaction. And since aspergillus colonizes the bronchial mucosa, it is a hypersensitivity reaction of the airways. Radiographically, it is described by fleeting infiltrates, although mucus plugging in bronchiectasis would not be unusual as it is a disease of the airways. The classic patient is an asthmatic or a patient with cystic fibrosis, don't forget about cystic fibrosis, demonstrated by this pressure volume loop showing an obstructive pattern. The diagnostic criteria include elevated eosinophil count with elevated IgE and the presence of IgE directed against aspergillus. I do include for your information the cytokines involved with recruiting eosinophils and stimulating IgE class switching. Make sure you're keeping track of these cytokines. These are favorite targets for the NBME. And that brings us to invasive aspergillosis. No special geography or ecology. The principal setting will be any of the neutropenic conditions. With this organism, the morphology is very much the money. The canidia are described as fruiting bodies, which sound delicious, but are largely irrelevant. However, septated hyphae branching at acute 45 degree angles is not irrelevant. This sentence, septated hyphae, branching at acute or 45 degree angles is the language of aspergillus. Lock that one on the brain. Septated distinguishes this mold from mucor. Insofar as immunity, I highlight that PMNs cannot phagocytize, so they line up on the hyphae and fire their arsenal trying to kill the suckers. That's great, except when there are no neutrophils. Boom, that's the setup for angioinvasive infection. Angioinvasive is bad. It implies necrosis, and indeed that's what's seen, necrotizing pneumonia or cavitary lesions in the setting of acute infection. This is nasty business. Let's keep this bug on the short list of causes for cavitary lung lesions. So here's aspergillus. It's a mold. It has hyphae that are septated and branch at 45 degrees. It grows canidia on its tip. In this instance, the fruiting body is called a canidophore, which is simply beautiful. Neutrophils kill and contain this bug. No neutrophils, and you have an aggressive angioinvasive infection characterized by necrotizing pneumonia. And finally, mucor mucosis, which includes both the mucor and rhizor species. Geography is not specifically important, but ecology and patient demographics are key. The ecology of this bug requires the presence of high sugar and acidosis. This is the perfect storm. In the absence of sweets and acid, the bug is easily destroyed. It thrives under these conditions because it elaborates the enzyme ketone reductase. The other piece of information related to the acidotic conditions is the increased availability of free iron. Free iron is like fertilizer for this bug, and thus the additional factoid about increased infection rates in patients treated with a chelating agent Diferoxamine. The infection itself is characterized by rhinocerebral or rhinoorbital cerebral infection, as we'll review in the next slide. Insofar as the microbiology, here is your key compare and contrast. Mucor is described by broad hyphae without septae and irregular branching at wide angles. Got that? Broad, irregular, and wide. That is a very different description than we heard with aspergillus. From the pathologic perspective, PMNs are important as they are with all hyphae, so neutropenia will further predispose to infection. Other key factor here, this too is angioinvasive. Angioinvasive equals necrosis, but this time, since the spores are found in the nares, we developed rhinoorbital and or cerebral infection. These will manifest as eschars in the nares, or if they are spread to contiguous structures, palatine involvement may be seen. So a diabetic with DKA and eschar equals mucor. The image further emphasizes the role of iron in contributing to invasiveness. The chipmunk facies in the image suggest extramedullary hematopoiesis. This patient would have beta thalassemia, iron overload, and treatment with a chelating agent, deferoxamine. That increases the amount of free iron, and the organisms dig iron. 
And here you can compare and contrast these two molds. Both are angioinvasive, but they have different ecologies and organ manifestations, with aspergillus characterized by the necrotizing pneumonia and mucor by rhinocerebral necrosis and eschar formation. The morphologies, other than both being hyphae, could not be more different in terms of septation and branching. And those, my friends, are the eight pulmonary fungal infections to be aware of each with very distinct and unique characteristics. Once you get past being incredulous that they want you to learn fungal morphology, the questions are very doable. If you have any questions or concerns about any of the material presented in this section, please email me at 12 days in March. Thank you.